Okay, so I'm going to make a start, everybody. Uh, first of all, welcome to this session, which I think is a very, very important session. Uh, obviously, for those of you who are not going to be able to join us today, uh, we will be sharing this session with you. But uh, as a first uh, thing, uh, just uh, some ground rules. So at the moment, what we're doing is we're going to have 30 minutes of peer review till 7.30. And then after that, Abhijit will be talking to us uh, with a little bit of revision of ultrasound physics. And I think the reason I wanted him to do that is because it is a very important, very crucial aspect of what we learn. But subsequent to that, what he will be doing is actually covering uh, a lot of uh, what we see as uh, abnormal lung. In particular, some of the pathologies, some of the signs that we see. Uh, so by the end of this session, we would have done 15 days now or two weeks of training, where if I summarize what we have covered is the physics of lung ultrasound, artifact, uh, the normal lung and its appearance, but in particular, what the abnormal lung looks like today. And you know, from, from here onwards, what I would like to emphasize is that we're really starting the business end of your learning, because uh, what, what we would expect now is that if you are able to and can share your screens uh, and presentations with videos, you can uh, use them and we can critique them and we can do peer review, which then kind of means that uh, you will be able to share your knowledge with us. And obviously from our perspective, we'll learn from you. So I think uh, uh, I can't emphasize enough how important uh, the, the coming sessions are. Uh, the session that I'm going to take on Tuesday in particular will summarize what I call is standardizing nomenclature. So what it aims to do is to put together the last two talks and summarizing exactly what standard terminology we will be using as a group when we're trying to describe our scans. So without further, uh, uh, without taking up more time, I'm going to hand over to Kirti. I'm going to mute myself and Abhijit, you can unmute yourself. Yeah. Okay, so this is uh, this was a late preterm baby with tachypnea and grunting. I did this scan at about 10 hours of life. There were no risk factors for sepsis and this baby was only on a high flow of four liters for a few hours. Mm -hmm. This was the chest x-ray that we had. These were some of the images that I had taken. So because I have a linear probe, I couldn't really divide the chest into upper anterior and lower anterior. It covered more, more or less the entire length of it altogether. So the first one is left anterior. I think that's the lung sliding, which I have marked. On the left lateral, it's the ribs, the pleural line, and the skin and soft tissue. I have placed left posterior here just to make it uniform, but I think my depth could have been more because there's just more of superficial part, which is visible on this one. Then in the right anterior, I suppose those are the A lines. That's the bat wing sign that I've tried to show in the right lateral and the right posterior. I, I think that next to the B lines, those small ones are the comet tails, which I might be wrong, but I thought the tinier ones, which are not going all the way deeper down. Right. Um, then I tried to take the seashore sign. Is that clear or it didn't seem like a real seashore that you see in the textbooks? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, um, uh, Lovely images, Katie. Um, uh, but there is not much of an information to say, you know, how much the depth was at that point on your um, uh, scans. So uh, can't really comment on, you know. I mean, it, ideally, it should be around three to four centimeters uh, your depth, and um, and it, it would have been easier to comment on the scans when you have those depths and your. Um, uh, focused, uh, you know, uh, marked on the screen. So you keep your focus at the pleural line. About the seashore sign, um, yes, um, it looks like a seashore sign, uh, but yes, um, it could, uh, you know, I would say it could have been a bit better, but yeah, it, it's, 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 it's a lovely one. 
And uh, another comment on the scans, we try to keep, uh, you, have, uh, you know, um, depicted your bad sign and um, A lines and B lines, uh, all are coming up lovely. Um, but uh, we try to keep our probes as perpendicular as possible, you know, rather than getting a slanting uh, image or a slanting um, ribs uh, or the pleural lines. We try to keep it as perpendicular as possible because um, the lung ultrasound is the whole, you know, it's, it's a game of artifacts. So we try to get it as, as perpendicular as possible to get the best of the artifacts feel. Is there a way to know in the image whether the probe I'm holding is perpendicular or have I slanted it a bit? Does does anything come out more prominently when you hold it perpendicular? Um, yes. So uh, the reason we are trying to put it as perpendicular as possible because um, that is the point where, gonna, where you're going to hit the pleural line at 90 degree angles. And that's where your, uh, you know, the A lines are generated the best or your B lines are seen the best. Um, is there a way to uh, know, um, you know, how we're going to put it as perpendicular as possible? It's just by looking at the image. You know, if your A line is coming straight up uh, or the pleural line is coming straight up, then that's a perpendicular. Uh, you're being perpendicular to the pleural line. If you see it sort of a slanting image, then um, uh, you're not being perpendicular. And uh, uh, try to keep your probe. Uh, you know, when you're talking about being perpendicular, try to keep it as perpendicular as possible to the ribs. It might not look like in a real baby, um, but we try to keep it as, as perpendicular to the ribs as possible. Okay. And uh, about your comment on the uh, lung rockets and the B lines. So uh, the best way to differentiate between the two is, yes, you're right. B lines reaches all the way to the bottom of the screen. Um, and whereas the lung rockets or the comet tail artifacts doesn't, number one. Number two, um, your comet tail artifacts should not be erasing the A lines. Now, on this image, they are erasing the A lines. I couldn't see the A lines. So, my best bet would be it would be a, you know, um, um, uh, B lines. Uh, as we can see, there is some, you know, loss of gain in the image uh, on the lower portion. So, we might have lost. Uh, uh, the uh, acquisition there, but uh, my bet would be it is a, still a B line because it's it's erasing the A lines. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And this, I think, was the liver image. And then next to this, I tried to do trans uh, trans diaphragmatic. Mm -hmm. I didn't do the scoring because I wasn't sure how to score R one R two because I don't have anterior upper anterior lower, so I I left it. Okay, so thank you. Thank you. So, uh, just uh, Doctor Lalok. Yeah, Doctor Fani Priya, I can hear you. Yeah. Sorry. So, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. I just right. I thought okay. uh, I just want to make sure whether I'm uh, audible. You're audible. That's correct. Yeah, I'll try to share my screen also. Sure, sure. Just while Dr. Fani Priya is sharing her screen, uh, I think I agree completely with Abhijit's commands. Uh, one of the things that can sometimes help, uh, Kirti, uh, in particular to make sure that your probe is 90 degrees, is you should be able to, when you're using your linear probe, see multiple ribs in parallel with the plural margin parallel to your probe. Now, the challenge becomes when you go into the upper axilla on the right and left sides, because getting a linear probe into the axilla is, is, is a real challenge. So what happens is you get foreshortening of your image in the superior axilla. So classically, I would say R1, R2, not too difficult. But as soon as you hit R3 and L3, you're really looking at the upper axilla. And my advice would be in those situations, uh, get a nurse to basically abduct the arm so that you can actually get your probe completely into the axilla and completely perpendicular so that it's not slanting, it, you know, it's not angulated. Similarly, I would say that just occasionally when you're on the back, there's the scapula, the back is, is quite challenging. The posterior regions can be quite challenging to get really good uh, images at 90 degrees. And one thing that I sometimes do is to get the back straight, I'll put a small shoulder roll under the baby, in particular under the shoulder, to kind of get the shoulder straight. Uh, I'll also try to image quite 
lateral to the spine. So, you know, the back is quite big. And as you slant, sometimes you're more lateral at the back. So try to keep yourself as close or just lateral to the spine and image those areas. And it might mean you have to move the image laterally to try and get your best image in that situation. So you might actually end up getting, you know, quite a few images for R5, R6, just to try and make sure that you've got your image acquisition really nice. Uh, other thing again, just to mention, as Abhijit mentioned, is that you're losing your image acquisition at the bottom. So, uh, I mean, I, I suspect that's probably depth. So I think your depth is okay, but just be careful of not interpreting that loss of image acquisition as consolidation. So you did have a nice consolidation there in one of the images, but uh, I tell you what, Kirti, uh, can you share those images again next time? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Dr. Fanny Priya, go ahead, please. Uh, have you shared your screen? Yeah, uh, look, I have started uh, sharing my screen. It is visible, right? Yeah, it is visible. Thank you. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, I'm, uh, uh, hello, uh, good evening, everyone. So I'm um, Dr. Fani Priya from PGI Chandigarh, India. Uh, I want to discuss uh, today the basic settings which I was using in the machine because I'm not very accustomed to lung ultrasound and also uh, ultrasound machine in particular. So I wanted to show what all settings I've uh, uh, done. So the machine used was uh, Philips Epic 7C and uh, I have these uh, knobs there where on the left side I, I could uh, uh, change the time gain compensation. And on the right side, I have only three knobs to adjust. One is for zoom, other is for depth, uh, and uh, third one is for focus. The three knobs which are on the right, these are the three things. These are only the things which I could adjust. And then uh, I've used the probe, uh, linear probe L12-3, and it is a kind of uh, uh, adult size. So I've uh, selected that probe, and then uh, I could see uh, only carotid uh, uh, artery, carotid general vascular, carotid vascular venous uh, axis, which are there. So I didn't know which one to use. So I've used the vascular venous uh, uh, module I have selected. Mm -hmm. So uh, these are the settings which I have done. Uh, these, these were all uh, settings which were uh, uh, set prior to this module. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have uh, uh, tried to see what are all the settings, how to see the plural line, uh, to see for lung sliding and to see for A and B line pattern. So this is baby K, uh, 34 weeks baby, uh, 2 kg, currently 15 day old, was a preterm, had HMD, was a post surfactant. Currently, doc, 15 day old. But, sorry, Dr. Fanny yeah, you might yeah. just want to go into slideshow. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, I'm sorry. That's all right. Yeah. So, uh, this baby was a case of uh, highland membrane disease, required surfactant, and then had persistent tachypnea. Currently, is on uh, HFNC 2 liters per minute, but there is no oxygen requirement. So uh, only issue is baby is having persistent tachypnea. Echo was done, which was normal, though there's no evidence of uh, uh, PPHN or any other uh, structural heart disease. And uh, uh, the settings which I've used, I've already told, and depth I have set at five centimeters. So this is the first uh, uh, image I tried uh, in the uh, L1 region. So here, uh, So here I can uh, uh, see plural sliding and also on M mode, uh, I'm able to see the seashore sign and uh, uh, there are no line, A lines visible. I could see uh, bat wing sign and multiple B lines. Yep. Uh, yeah. yeah. 
and right. then uh, this is the image which i have taken from uh, in the uh, uh, left uh, l3 l3 area so mm -hmm. this is also showing uh, it is there is a good pleural sliding pleura is well visible but i could not uh, make out any a lines it is predominantly densely uh, packed b lines which i could appreciate and then this is uh, on the back as you have explained i had a lot of difficulty in doing the ultrasound on the back i could not uh, get clear picture and this is the picture which i could uh, get sure right okay um uh, funny priya if you can go to your first uh, uh, you know uh, image the slide will be the first yeah, sure. yeah um Um, so, uh, yeah, as you rightly said, uh, there's a plural sliding, plural line, there's a bat wing sign appearance. Um, I can't appreciate any A lines in this particular image. And uh, you have beautifully demonstrated the M mode, uh, um, uh, getting the uh, sandy beach or a seashore sign. Um, just to, you know, to critique this uh, particular frame here, what I would have done is your focus is way down. I would have loved to keep that at the plural line. Uh, I don't know if you can see my pointer, yeah, but yeah, yeah, I could get. I, I I understood. Yeah, so your focus focus should be at the plural line because that's where your uh, you know the whole game is. So um, I would like to keep the focus at the plural line. Then it will give you more um, uh, crisper image. Um, that's number right. one. Uh, five centimeter of depth is fine, but. Um, you know, um, uh, for babies, uh, three to four centimeter also uh, does the thing, and you don't uh, have a blackout areas on the screen if you um, keep it at three to four centimeter. Here, we don't see any blackouts or any fallouts yeah. of the image, but sometimes you do get, you know, in a situation like that. Um, uh, that's one thing, and I think um, the second thing I would have done in this particular image is about the gain. Um, now I really can't say how much it should have gone up or down, but you know, first thing is the focus. And once we keep the focus, it auto adjust uh, most of the time. And if it doesn't, then you have to sort of tailor it uh, um, to get the best of the image there. Um, so yeah, otherwise, uh, lovely image. Yeah. Uh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Yes. So, so just one uh, comment, uh, just to add a uh, fantastic uh, kind of uh, image, but uh, just for those of you, if you see on the right side of the screen, there's an X3. That X3 is actually the focus. And that is what you have to really get to the plural line. So you want to get that at the margin of the plural. And uh, the reason why this is so important is because the plural here looks quite, I'd say irregular. Mm. Uh, and it's, it's, blurred and really the problem could be that your focus is below so that's why you're interpreting the plural line like that so hence abhijit's absolutely right what you really want to do is get your you level at the level of the plural because you might find that you actually interpret the plural in a different way in its appearance uh, right. uh, yeah. and the only other thing is these are lovely compact lines they're beautiful yeah <laughs> so well done <laughs> thank you carry on thank you yeah thank you. one more one more thing i would like to add for all the participants uh you know when we are presenting it if we can keep the video on the loop it becomes easier to interpret because it runs for you know half a second or so so it really becomes difficult so if you keep it on a loop you know in a slideshow it becomes easier to interpret the images Okay, okay, Dr. Abhijit. Uh, I have few queries regarding the settings. Mm -hmm. uh, as you have told, we should uh, change the gain uh, in this particular machine because uh, in other eco machines, uh, uh, there is an option for changing gain. But in this machine, I could not, uh, there is no uh, 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 option to change the gain. Only TGC is there. So how could I have done it? Uh, um, only thing which I could... Like I could uh, uh, changes the uh, all the things which are shown on the left. Like uh, there is a 
R S which is written, and then uh, C might be contrast, mm -hmm. and uh, P low I think is penetrance low and resolution. Yeah. Low. Uh, yeah. I'm I'm not well versed with the uh, scanner you're using, but sometimes what happens is if you change your like you have used the vascular mode, so I'm I'm sure there will be something as a musculoskeletal uh, mode as well or superficial mode, and uh, the machine gives you an um, a free hand to change your uh, gains. Some of the scanners also comes with the eye scan button, which yeah, does the this job comes with eye scan. Yeah, so if you hit the eye scan, uh, uh, it automatically adjusts. But uh, mind you, first we need to get the uh, focus right before we hit that eye scan because it's gonna mm -hmm. it's gonna focus on that particular area where you are keeping your you know the focus at. So um, yeah, um, try changing the mode and see if you go to superficial and it uh, the machine allows you to uh, change your gain settings. Okay, okay, thank you. Right? Yeah, thank you. I have only a single case for today. Okay. Okay. And we'll talk about all these A lines, B lines and artifacts today in our um, session today. So I haven't dwelled too much on um, on the images, but guys, I've got a beautiful images. Uh, we're going to talk about all these artifacts and its generation and everything in the session and how to optimize your scan. Yeah. So Anna, would you like to share your screen? Are you presenting today? Yes, I can present. That's beautiful. We'd be very grateful. Thank you so much. Uh, I can see the to share the screen button. Yep. I can ask something. Yep. So if there's if there's loss of A lines or artifacts in the deeper part of the screen, is there a way that we can fix it? Can I do something to make it better? Uh, loss of you're asking particularly about loss of A lines in the deeper part of the screen? I mean, loss of any lines from the, because some of my images, we could see the superficial part, but deeper down there was loss of. So what do you think happened there? That um, again, it has to do with the depth, um, focus, and the uh, uh, your uh, gain settings. So we're going to talk about, uh, you know, how to optimize those things and, you know, not to have a fallout of images uh, in the session today. Um, we'll we'll talk about it on the session. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I can see the invita invitation to share. I can see it. Can you invite me again, Alok? I can see to share the screen. I, I have not that um, invitation. Are you listening to me? So I can hear you, Anna. Yeah. I, I, I can't see the. Oh, uh, now it's here. Okay. Yeah. Can you see my slides? Yes. Okay. So can I start? Go ahead, Anna. Okay. Yep. So we have a, a, a male late preterm boy mm -hmm. with a, a birth weight of 1,620. He completed the prenatal corticosteroid maturation. It was a C-section because of the mother with preeclampsia and the fetal growth restriction. Mm -hmm. He born well. He was connected to CPAP with a low FiO2 medium. And the blood gas were okay, and he was okay during the first day. Um, 
in the in the day after uh, I could do a uh, ultrasound. I don't know how I can look this out. And these are R1. Mm -hmm. We can see sliding well and the A lines. The product yeah. they are predominant. And uh, in R2, we can see a I think we can see a double lung point here. Because here more B lines and at top more A lines. Mm -hmm. And these are free. Um, we can see when the baby uh, is in expiration, the pattern is worse with more collapse and then more aerated when he is in inspiration. I think it's um, very well seen here. Yeah. And uh, this is the left side. A bit worse with more B lines than the right one. Mm -hmm. and L2 and L3 and I think you can see the double lung point again here so I guess um, for the clinical and the ultrasound it was a transient tachypnea of the newborn but the day after this at um, 6 a.m the baby gets worse with mm -hmm. polypnea, respiratory distress, uh, no saturating well. And uh, I, I was in, on duty and did the uh, ultrasound. And um, here I was a little in doubt if there was a, a lung point here because this was not sliding so well. Mm -hmm. I did the uh, uh, M mode, but uh, I was a bit confused because I. I I don't know if this was a barcode sign or not. I was starting ultrasound. I was not so confident. So I did it in another mode. I, I tried again. Mm -hmm. And I think this is more clear that we have the lung point. This is sliding and they are not sliding so well. And the M mode, I think here is more clear a barcode sign. Absolutely. Um, so this was the x-ray I think I have to okay and we confirmed that there is a pneumothorax in the right side mm -hmm. of the chest and just to to say that uh, some days later I repeated the scan and it was great <laughs> Lung sliding, uh, no lung point, uh, and, and the baby was fine. And here, uh, the, the seashore sign. Well, in between, it, it was taped with a needle and uh, drained the hair. Mm -hmm. it, it didn't need to, to be with a drain, drainage, only the needle to right. take the hair off. So I think is this, I don't have more slides, I guess. This is, a, these are my settings um, of my lung uh, settings in my yeah. ultrasound machine. Right. Yep. This is a GE machine, isn't it? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I can see that. Yeah. Yeah. The focus. Mm -hmm. Yep. Excellent uh, images, Anna, and uh, very nicely depicted lung point and, uh, you know, seashore and the sand. Uh, what do you call stratosphere sign or barcode sign? Um, yeah, lovely images. <clears throat> Thank you.
think what I'd highlight with this case is the fact that, uh, you know, you're going to be able to make this diagnosis very quickly with lung ultrasound, as opposed to having to wait for the chest X-ray, uh, expose the baby to radiation. I think there is, however, a learning curve where while you're learning, doing the chest X-ray, uh, you know, helps to back up your your diagnosis. And this is what I would say to all the participants at this particular point, is that while you're actually learning lung ultrasound, don't hesitate to use the chest X-ray as your gold standard. To start off with, uh, a lot of us, when, we, when I started learning lung ultrasound, I would actually look at the pathology on the chest X-ray and uh, kind of think about what I would see on lung ultrasound. And then in the course of my learning, I've gone back to doing lung ultrasound first, thinking of my diagnosis, and then doing a chest X-ray to kind of validate what I think after clinical correlation. And now yes. I think I've reached a, a level where I, I feel that actually I, you know, I, I don't need a chest X-ray. So what you'll find is all of you will go through this uh, gradually, and you know, using the the chest X-ray to interpret your findings would be fantastic. Uh, Abhijit, you've got some questions in the chat. Uh, so what I was gonna say is that uh, Rana. We're going to let Abhijit tell us that when he takes us through the talk. Is that okay? So one of Rana's questions is, can we quantify the size of the pneumothorax? So I'll let Abhijit cover that when he gives his talk. Okay. Uh, I had Zahreddin also raise his hand. Zahreddin, did you have a question? A quick one. Look, thank you so much. Uh, just uh, what is the medical legal stand on chest X-ray versus ultrasound to prove a pneumothorax? So actually what I'd say to you is that the sensitivity and the specificity of the combination of a lack of plural sliding, uh, an A profile uh, with uh, a barcode sign is much higher than a chest X-ray. Uh, I'd also say to you that there are pneumothoraces, very small ones that a chest X-ray might not pick up that can be picked up by lung ultrasound. In particular, uh, you know, I would say smaller air collections, which, you know, might be a very small amount of air. And uh, there is absolutely no doubt. I mean, from a diagnosis perspective, lung ultrasound is much more sensitive and specific. Uh, I think a chest X-ray, you know, uh, is, is obviously something that we've learned. I would say that what is very important is how you clinically correlate. You know, like we're used to doing a chest X-ray waiting, seeing if the baby's stable. You know, most of us uh, in this particular situation where the baby doesn't have a tension pneumothorax would probably get the chest X-ray to try and quantify uh, how severe the pneumothorax is. A lung ultrasound can do that very, very effectively. I mean, in terms of medical legal kind of grounds, I think if you clinically correlate, demonstrate on a lung ultrasound that you've got a pneumothorax clinically, you have time to wait. I would still do a chest X-ray. The reason for that is, I think it's helping my diagnosis. It's helping aid my diagnosis. Clinically, I think if I've got a tension pneumothorax, I'd probably be making that diagnosis clinically and lung ultrasound would be supportive. But I'd probably be needling that on clinical grounds. Translumination in extremely preterm babies, and I'll just give you an example, can actually be positive even without having a pneumothorax. And uh, I've recently been in a situation where I've had uh, a baby who's 24 weeks, who had very severe PIE. Now, the question from my perspective is, he suddenly deteriorates and starts desaturating two hours later. And I have to wait for a chest X-ray to happen. Uh, the question from my perspective is, if I transluminate him, I might, and I did get actually positive translumination. The question is, is that PIE or a pneumothorax? And I mean, the lung ultrasound was confirmatory. So, I think rather than thinking about the medical legal approach, I would say that, and this is what I will talk about on Tuesday, what is very important from our perspective is developing a guideline, which basically says, well, this is how we're going to diagnose pneumothorax. And then agreeing that, well, if the baby's stable, I might agree that I want a chest X-ray. I can tell you for a fact that in Paris, where Nadia uh, practices, they don't do chest X-rays at all. And they treat pneumothoraces and they put chest strains in with lung ultrasound. And they use lung ultrasound to define the lung point to actually define where the drain has to go in. That is also very important. So you can see how it really depends on the confidence that you have as a, you know, a person performing the lung ultrasound 
as to you make the diagnosis and you opt to treat. And I think that learning curve, you know, that that takes time. Does that help your question? I think if you had a guideline which said, and you were able to diagnose a pneumothorax, transluminate, clinically correlate, and then drained it, I don't think anything would be a problem medically. Really. Yes, thanks a lot, sir. Thank you. I'm going to let Abhijit share his screen because we're 7.30 exactly. So Abhijit, go for it. Yeah. Right, everyone can see my slide? Yes. Yes. Lovely. <clears throat> okay, so, um, <clears throat> right, good morning, afternoon, evening to everybody from around the globe. Um, so, yeah, I've been tasked with the um, having these sessions on um, uh, the abnormal lung. But uh, before we get to the abnormal lung, I will be uh, going through the little bit of physics um, um, and then how the this A lines, B lines, and all the signs and RFX we talk about are generated so that we have a grasp of a normal looking lung. And, uh, and so um, we can make a uh, uh, judgment call that this is a normal lung. Anything deviates from this will be an abnormal lung. So uh, in abnormal lung also, I'm just going to cover the um, uh, the kind of collapse consolidations and uh, pneumothorax today. Um, yeah, so let's begin then. Right, so <clears throat> the objectives today, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the physics. I'm not going to dwell too much on it because Alok has at length spoken about the physics and, and uh, of the ultrasound. So uh, just a bit of physics followed by um, a recap on the profiles so far we have uh, uh, gone through. We'll talk about pattern recognition and, um, and then uh, we're going to talk about the pneumothorax and collapse and consolidations at the end. So physics. Um, <clears throat> we all know about the piezoelectric effect. Um, again, uh, we'll just quickly run through the slides about uh, piezoelectric effect, frequency and wavelength, um, uh, acoustic impedance, what, uh, what all this leads to in terms of, you know, the image generation and what kind of a um, lung pathology changes uh, 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 in terms of uh, uh, getting this uh, image. Um, with all this, um, uh, with all these concepts in hand, so piezoelectric effect is very straightforward. It's about the um, crystal where you apply some electricity and it gives out ultrasound waves. And as the name suggests, it's um, uh, the ultrasonic waves are um, um, beyond the uh, range of twenty thousand hertz, um, which is beyond our hearing range, and hence they are called ultrasonic. So. Um, and piezoelectric uh, crystals also have the property when it receives sounds, it generates electricity, which is decoded by the scanner and gives us an image. Um, so that's piezoelectric effect. I'm not going to talk too much about it. Um, so this is how the piezoelectric crystals are um, uh, placed in the uh, transducer. And um, so from here, your uh, sounds waves are generated. It, go and hit the uh, the organ of intent and reflect it back or refract it, which is again decoded by the um, uh, scanner and gives us an um, image or the video. Right, frequency and wavelength. Very crucial to understand here um, the concept of the frequency and the wavelength. Um, because uh, when we know this, then we choose the right probe, uh, not only for the ultrasound, uh, lung ultrasound, for any point of care ultrasound, be it brain, abdomen, um, echoes, um, scans for the lines and stuff like that. So um, how are you going to choose your probe uh, depends on uh, this concept of frequency and wavelength of the ultrasound wave. So um, in terms of 
frequency, I would like to understand, I mean, uh, this is how I think about the frequencies, you know, um, it is a number of ultrasound waves generated every minute. Hertz is the unit of frequency. So um, if you have a higher frequency, that means you are generating more number of ultrasonic waves, the distance between or the time between the two of or, or the consecutive waves will be much less compared to the frequency which is low that is low number of waves are generated so the um the time gap between the two um waves will be higher so this is what it is depicted here so <clears throat> how it impacts us uh, in a clinical scenario so if you have a high frequency waves then you get a very crisp image you get a you know ultra high definition sort of image but at the loss of the penetration so you can you can use a high frequency probe to visualize any organ or structure which is very superficial because it will give you a very crisp image but it can only visualize the superficial organs if you have to look deeper into the body then you have to go for a low frequency higher wavelength uh, probe so as to say uh, you want to uh, look at the <clears throat> abdominal organs then you would like to have a low frequency um, higher wavelength probe if you want to look at anything as lung which is pleural line very superficial we always talk about the depth of three to four centimeters so you can imagine it's a very superficial structure um, or you know for the um, vascular uh, uh, ultrasounds again very superficial structure there you need um, a higher frequency probe which will give you a very uh, crisp image um, of the uh, superficial structures so this is a relationship between the uh, low frequency uh, i mean the frequency and the resolution so on your x-axis you have your resolution and on your y-axis you've got your frequency of the probes and you can see the phased arrays the one which we use for the um you know different thing uh, 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 from echoes sometimes for the head scans uh, uh, and the um deeper vascular structures uh, in the abdomen so you can see it's a very low frequency so you can you can imagine it can it can go to very deeper organs and um, so <clears throat> you can see if you have a low frequencies your penetration depicted by this purple line is quite high so you can see very deeper structures with this but at the cost of your resolution you can see it has got you know, you can see anywhere, but you, you, you don't see a, a, a very crisp or high definition image of that. As your frequency increases, you know, the <laughs> curvilinear and the linear probes, as you all are using linear at the moment, so uh, 5 to 15 megahertz, you get a very, you know, um, you get a, a high resolution picture, but at the cost of the penetration. So you cannot see deeper structures, but whatever you see, the superficial structure, it gives you a very crisp image. Right, acoustic impedance. <clears throat> acoustic impedance is nothing but it's a resistance to the sound waves. So you can imagine if you have a higher resistance, anything which has got a very high resistance, the kind of image generated from that structure will be bright white. And anything that has got a low resistance, say for example, fluid, where it, it, it doesn't give you uh, much of a resistance to ultrasonic waves, so um, uh, it, it, it appears darker or black in color uh, in the scanner. So higher the resistance, higher the reflection. Higher the reflection, you get a very um, bright image. And lower the impedance, lower the resistance, you get low reflections. So you get darker um, uh, uh, images. So low reflection and uh, 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 low refraction as well. So um, this is what I said exactly. Occurs, reflection occurs when there's a large difference in impedance between the two tissues and you get a bright white uh, image. And refraction occurs when the impedance or the resistance is low so that some of the waves can pass through that particular structure. Then you get refracted waves rather than reflected. This image will, um, uh, the schematic will explain it better. So when you ultrasound waves are hitting a particular structure for our sake let's say this is a pleural line it's gonna hit and then reflect so this is your reflected waves which will be interpreted by the scanner 
as it has a very high impedance, say 90% of your waves are reflected back. So it's going to give you a bright image. As you can see, the plurals are, plural lines are very bright and discrete. Say it passes through, you know, liver or something, which is again, um, it's a low impedance uh, structure uh, or the organ. So you will have, say, 100 ultrasonic waves are coming out. 50% got reflected and 50% get refracted. Refracted as in it can pass through the structure. And of course, there will be um, uh, some reflection from there as well. And hence, you will get more of a darker image. And this concept is important because from here, we talk about the echogenicity, you know, an echoic, isoechoic, um, uh, hyperechoic uh, sort of a structure. So we'll, we'll come to that again. And then there's attenuation and absorption, again, which depends on your acoustic impedance. If you have a very high impedance or high resistance, you're going to reflect most of the waves. So you will not get much of an attenuation at that point, and uh, there will not be much of an absorption. If, if it passes through some of the structure, which uh, allows the ultrasound waves to pass through, then you will get attenuation and absorption of the uh, waves. And we will see how it uh, impacts the image or the artifacts generated in the um, upcoming slides. Um, <clears throat> so this particular phenomenon of attenuation and absorption gives us a shadowy, uh, shadowing artifacts, which, uh, which is also called as a batwing sign, as uh, some of the participants has already uh, demonstrated in the scan today. So attenuation gives us this shadowing artifact because you're, when you hit something and it's reflected back, anything uh, beyond that structure uh, has a, a fallout in the image because scanner doesn't perceive uh, anything beyond that so it will give you a blackout area and uh, and gives a particularly bad being sign so we will will demonstrate that as well and then we have echogenicity so an echoic just to you know go through the terminology uh, an echoic is black so fluid is black in ultrasound anything that is fluid will appear black in the scanner. As, as depicted here, this is a bladder and it's filled with uh, fluid, uh, urine. So it's anechoic and it's black in color. Then hyperechoic, bright white. So anything that reflects most of the uh, ultrasound waves that will give you a bright white color. Bone is the brightest as you can imagine. And so is the pleural line. So, um, uh, so that's your pleural line and it appears hyperechoic compared to your soft tissues um, in the vicinity because it allows the sound waves to pass on and then it hits the pleural line and, um, um, and is reflected. So it gives you the bright, bright uh, image. Um, hypoechoic. Hypoechoic is nothing, but it's a you know uh, it's a play between the anechoic and hyperechoic. So when we talk about hypoechoic, we are talking in terms of relative. Um, so liver appears darker than the kidney. So liver is hypoechoic compared to the kidney. So um, or for that matter, bladder will appear hypoechoic to the uh, uh, kidney. Um, so an um, isoechoic is again uh, in terms of uh, relativity, it's it's um, it's similar in echogenicity. So your spleen and liver or spleen and kidney um, uh, uh, kidney cortex, uh, to be precise, um, um, are isoechoic to each other. So, <clears throat> um, so it's just just the play between the black and the bright white gives you hypoechoic and the isoechoic um, images. Right. So. I think we all know why we do um, ultrasound scans, and I'm talking about point of care ultrasound, so um, uh, which encompasses the uh, lung ultrasound as well. So it's it's very limited, it is very focused, and uh, it is always done by the bedside, so you don't have to move your babies or patients anywhere, and it's always and always done by the clinicians. So 
um, um, we are trying to find an answer to a very specific question when we are doing a point of care ultrasound. And so is the lung ultrasound as well. So it is, it is always done in a clinical context. And I cannot emphasize it more. Um, I think Alok has spoken uh, many times about it. So it's all about the clinical context, the clinical background. Because lung ultrasound, you don't see lung. You only see the artifacts. Um, and those artifacts can be generated in wide variety of uh, pathologies, in the wide variety of the clinical conditions. So to correctly interpret those things in terms of a, um, a, a, the clinical scenario, you need to have a background of the, um, of the patient or of the baby. So it's very important. It is done in a clinical context. A random uh, scan without any um, uh, you know, background or the clinical background will not be able to interpret much. We can say these signs are there or these artifacts are there, but it won't be answering you in terms of pathology, what kind of pathology we are dealing with. And the focus always guide care. So it, it, you can tailor your care depending on um, your scan result. Okay, so we know when to do it. Now the question is, how do we do it? Right. So lung is a very simple organ, unlike heart, which is always moving in different chambers and, you know, the flows and stuff like that, or the abdomen, which contains almost 21 organs. So lung is nothing like it. It's, it's, it's a very simple sack of, uh, you know, uh, uh, air. So it's a very simple organ. And mind you, in terms of, you know, the point of care ultrasound where the you know, heart, abdomen and other structures are involved, lung uh, ultrasound is the most gross, you know, because again, as I'm telling you, it's, it's all about the artifacts. You don't look at the lung, you don't see lung, you only see the artifacts. So it's very gross. And all the science arises from the pleural line. Whatever it is we're going to talk about or whatever uh, science we're going to talk about is all arises from the pleural line. Again, beyond the pleural line, there is air, which ultrasound waves hits it and it generates artifacts. So whatever you're going to see, uh, in the lung ultrasound is arising from the pleural line. Lung signs are mainly based on the analysis of the artifacts, as I've already uh, said that. And lung is a dynamic organ, and so are the signs. Um, so we always say that we don't we don't take a snapshot of a, a, a lung ultrasound. We, unlike the you know the head scanner and thing uh, <clears throat> where we take just a snapshot, you don't do that because. Pleural, uh, the lung is dynamic, the pleura is moving, and we need all those movements to correctly interpret the artifact or uh, uh, to answer the um, uh, specific question about the pathology. So dynamic scan. What kind of probes we used? We have already spoken, and uh, um, uh, Alok has already uh, spent quite a bit of time on the probe selection and all. Um, just to uh, run past, Phase arrays are mostly used, as you can see, it's quite low on the uh, frequency. So it is mostly used for your deeper structures. It has a very small footprint as well. So um, um, it's mostly used for the echoes and all. Um, linear uh, probe is the one which we'd like to use for the lung ultrasound because it has got the uh, maximum uh, frequency. So it gives you a very uh, superficial and uh, crisp image. Hockey stick is just the extension of the linear probe. Uh, it has got a smaller footprint, unlike a, you know, the conventional linear one, but again, very high frequency and used mostly uh, used for the um, vascular structures or the lung ultrasound. Curvilinear is my favorite one. It's, 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 the, it's the most versatile one. You can look at anything or everything in the body, including the lung. We just have to be uh, mindful of the limitation of it but it's a great probe to have. If you don't have anything else, curvilinear will do the job. So phase area probes has a great penetration, but okay resolution um, because it goes uh, deeper into the structure and, and it has a small footprint. Curvilinear, good penetration, good resolution, good probe, and it's the most versatile probe. So if you don't have anything, your curvilinear will get you through. Linear probe or by extension hockey stick has got a very poor penetration, but very you know, excellent resolution. And this is, if you have it, nothing like it, you can use this for the lung ultrasound. Again, not going to go through this, but uh, just to, uh, you know, emphasize that why we are selecting and what you are selecting uh, in terms of doing the scans. Right, artifacts. 
So there are a lot of artifacts we're going to talk about and how these artifacts are generated and um, what you interpret from those artifacts and uh, how the, uh, the patho lung pathologies, um, you know, give different kind of an artifacts. So reverberation artifact, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about acoustic shadowing, comet tail artifacts and mirror image artifact. Um, trust me, there are a lot more, but uh, just to uh, not to sort of uh, you know, uh, drown you guys with uh, <laughs> a lot of artifacts. Uh, yeah, I'm just limiting myself to this four, and there will be a couple of more uh, as we go up in the slides. Reverberation artifact, uh, it, it gives us A and B lines. Um, and just for understanding, A lines are generated when there is a horizontal reverberation. So reverberation is back and forth movement of the ultrasonic waves. So if you, if you, if your waves are doing this, then it's it generates a line and we will see in the slides what i mean by this and when we talk about the b lines it is a vertical reverberation so it is doing like this you know back and forth and um, it will give you a vertical reverberation so um so let's talk about the uh, a lines how it is generated so you can see there's a soft tissue there and that's a plural line the bright white line is a plural line and you can see those are the a waves um, and A waves always come equidistant uh, from each other. So up there is where you're going to uh, put your probe and white line is a plural line and down below the plural line is all air. So when the ultrasonic uh, waves hits the plural line, it's go back and hits the probe because it's all reflected. So say suppose this is the transducer and it takes T time or T seconds uh, to reach the plural line and it hit backs and it generates the image of plural line. But this sound wave is going to come back again because it's, it's going to do back and forth because it is being reflected so much that it comes back again to the plural line and goes back up. Now it is taken twice the time of, uh, uh, of the first wave. So it's going to generate one more line. That's your A line. By A, it means air. So air line. Again, third wave, uh, the same wave, it's going to do back and forth and reach the probe again. So it has taken three times the um, uh, uh, times compared to the first wave. So it generates the third one here. So you can see the distance between your probe and the plural line will be equidistant for all the A lines. This distance will always be the same and hence the A lines are generated. A lines are generated when there is air. So A for air. Um, you can see that's your probe. You're going to apply it on the, uh, uh, on the chest. We are trying to keep everything as perpendicular as possible. Um, there you can see your rib and uh, that's your bright line is your plural line. So your ultrasonic waves are coming and hitting the plural line and it's doing back and forth because it's been Plura is being highly reflective and none of the wave can pass beyond the plura because there is air. So <clears throat> your um, A lines are generated equidistance from the plural line. So this distance, sorry about that. So your distance from the probe to the plural line uh, will always be uh, equal uh, in terms of generation of the A line. Moving on. Um, again, depicting the same thing. I also like to talk about the plural sliding at the same point of time. So nice and beautiful um, uh, A lines here, uh, plural line, and then the A lines. You can see your plura is sliding. So your parietal and the visceral plura, the parietal plura is static, but your visceral plura slides along the parietal plura. And it gives you an impression of an ant crawling effect. If you see, you know, the, like ant, the marching of the ants. So it looks more like an ant crawling effect. So if you see what I mean, so um, that's that's plural, plural sliding. And uh, it's a very important sign. Uh, uh, we always look at the plural line first the plural line is present and then we talk about the plural sliding and then we go to a lines and b lines and 
commit till our effects and whatnot. But always, is there a plural line, number one, and then is there a plural sliding? The second question is always plural sliding. And <clears throat> again, we like to give names, you know, by the um, all stretch of imagination. So um, this looks more like a bamboo spine. Um, if you see what I uh, mean, it, it looks like a, you know, the, uh, the bamboo, the bamboo trees. Um, again, it's nothing uh, but the um, uh, the A lines all the way to the bottom of the screen. Now, if I have to critic this uh, image, everything else is fine over here except for your um, uh, what do you call this focus. And you can see if you keep your keeping your focus here, um, which is not the right thing to do. It should be supposedly here at the level of the plural line. Um, you will see a lot of black blackouts. Um, uh, so this focus into three should always be at the level of the plural line. And we'll come to that again later. So that was uh, horizontal reverberation and now uh, giving us A lines. Now let's talk about the vertical reverberation. Now vertical reverberation is this movement and um, that's a plural line. And then uh, this bright white uh, hyperechoic uh, lines reaching all the way to the bottom of the skin like a laser is the B line. So this is how it is generated. So that's your that's your um, fluid field um, uh, alveolus. So these are different alveolus um, and there's a septus in between and there is your fluid. Um, so whenever you do a scan and your ultrasonic sounds comes through it, as I said, it loves the fluid. So it, it has no problem coming all the way in. But then these alveoli are filled with air, so it reflects back and forth. So when it is reflecting back and forth, that's how your B lines are generated. So consider B lines as a curly B lines on the chest X-ray. It is same thing as curly B lines. So it is. Um, so you get B lines when anything that is uh, that should be filled with air is getting filled with fluid. Now that could be, you know fluid, blood or whatever, but it's, it's, it has to be some sort of a fluid. And then that, that uh, gives you a uh, B lines. Right, so here is the depiction of the B lines. So um, <clears throat> again, if you see this particular area over here, you can see these lines are reaching all the way to the bottom of the screen. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Again, first thing first, is there a plural line? Yes, there is a plural line. Is there is a plural sliding? Yes, you can see the B lines are moving all with your uh, respiration. So yes, there is a plural sliding. Can we see the A lines? Yes, we do see the A lines. These are the A lines. Can we see B lines? Yes, it comes up. And as I said before, if it is a B line, it's always gonna erase the A line. So you can see whenever the B lines are coming in the view, your A lines disappears. Yeah, so that's a B line. Let's talk about the uh, acoustic shadowing artifact. So this gives us the bat wing appearance. Um, it's a stretch of imagination again. Uh, why bat? Don't ask me. Uh, I'll try to um, uh, show you as much of a bat as possible on this lung scan. But um, acoustic shadowing uh, uh, gives you the bat sign. So again, this is uh, the ribs. Uh, soft tissue, you apply your um, uh, probe here, and then this is a kind of uh, image that is generated. Bone being highly reflective, it reflects 100% of the waves back to the probe. So you see bone as very bright uh, line, um, uh, bright image, but anything beyond bone will be lost. So that's a shadowing because your sound waves are not penetrating through the bone. So it's 100% reflected back. So there's nothing to show beyond the bone. So that's a rib shadow. Um, and then here will be your pleura. And through the pleura, because there is air here, your uh, ultrasonic waves will always reverberate horizontally and gives you the um, uh, A lines. So, and the father of the ultrasound, I think um, Daniel Ligenstein has uh, imagined this as a bad sign. So, um, Let's see if it looks like a bat. So there you go. That's a plural line. 
um and that's your bat so bone will be the you know um you can see here will be your bone and then there is your rib shadow and that's your body of the bat so this is the most i can uh, make of a bat on a lung ultrasound um but you got the idea so that, that that's a bat wing appearance so wing shadow body um bat sign Comet tail artifacts, um, they are also known as the lung rockets. Again, uh, you can imagine all sorts of things. Um, <clears throat> so um, this is what I'm talking about. So any line, just consider comet tail or the uh, lung rockets as a precursor of the B line. So there is some fluid, maybe some drops of fluid. So it's not enough to generate that kind of a reverberation so that it reaches all the way to the bottom of the screen. But it is um, it is very short, um, and it terminates midway, and it doesn't erases the A line. So you can see there are, of course, there are some B lines there, which is reaching all the way to the bottom of the screen. But these are small, small rockets which just ends up, it terminates midway. So um, um, that's where the uh, are the comet tail or or the lung rockets. Again. Um, when, whenever we see the image, we always ask the same question again and again. Is there a plural line? Yes. Sharp and discrete, smooth plural line. Is there a sliding? Yes, of course. It's, uh, it is sliding. You can see lung rockets. If you see lung rockets or you see B lines, lung is sliding. And then you can see your A lines and B lines and lung rockets. Same thing over here. So these are small, small lung rockets. We are just terminating midway. Mirror image artifact. So <clears throat> mirror images are also a creation by the uh, reverberation uh, artifacts. So um, you see the mirror image of you know whatever you are scanning, basically. So when we're talking about the lung scan, so this is your soft tissue, your bones, and then uh, you see a very sharp um, plural line followed by the A lines. Where is the mirror image? You can see whatever, you know, above the plural line, you can see the same thing below the plural line as well. So these are the mirror image artifacts. What it tells you? Well, it tells you for the reverberation, you need um, uh, what do you call this air to reverberate basically. So what it tells you is uh, there is air and which is not letting the ultrasound wave to pass through. So it is bouncing back and forth and it is giving you a mirror image. Whatever is on the other side of the pleura, it's showing the same thing uh, uh, beyond the pleural line as well. So that's what the mirror image is. And you can see mirror images in all, uh, all the scans of the body. So to show you another example, so this is, uh, the curvilinear probe again and uh, uh, you can see this is liver that's your um, uh, diaphragm coming here and you can see you can see the liver on both the side now you can see the vessels coming here the same vessels coming here what it basically tells you if you can see a mirror image the other side also is having some bit of air so you can safely assume that okay ideally it should be looking like this so you see your liver um, and uh, beyond the uh, liver, you can see the vessels, you can see the vertebrae, but you don't see the mirror image of the air because here is here there is no air. The ultrasound waves can pass through the organs. Here, on the other hand, because of the air, it cannot pass through and do, it does back and forth and it gives you a mirror image. So basically, it's a sign when there is a pneumothorax. Right, now coming on to lung presets. So what kind of a preset, I mean, the new fancier machines have uh, started coming with the lung preset now, but um, um, the old machines are also good. Um, they are better actually um, without the harmonics, which uh, sort of uh, clear all your artifacts. Um, so um, we're gonna discuss what kind of a setting we can uh, do to, you know, uh, make use of any ultrasound scanner to do lung scan. So the mode, 
uh, we always use superficial or a muscular mode because um, uh, we're going to use a high frequency probe and we are trying to look at a very superficial structure with a very uh, good clarity. So we always use a superficial or a muscular mode or a vascular mode. All these are um, uh, superficial structures. Then we try to focus our things. So whenever you put a probe, you have selected the probe, uh, you know, the linear probe or a hockey stick probe, and you are putting it on the chest of the baby. It immediately gives you some image. And there you first thing you focus is at the pleural line. As I always said, first question is pleural line. Is the pleural line visible? Yes. Is there a pleural sliding present? Yes or no, whatever. So we talk about the pleural line. So whenever you see the pleural line, get your focus on the pleural line. So once you've done that, you adjust your depth, ideally three to four centimeter. You don't have to go beyond four centimeter because you can imagine, um, you know, the baby's um, uh, chest and the pleural line will be just at three or four centimeter at max from your uh, probe. So that's the ideal depth you'd like to get so that you don't have the fallout of uh, uh, images. Width. So how much width are you going to get? So ideally two intercoastal spaces uh, with the three ribs. Reason for why two intercoastal space? Because then you're going to see the bat wing sign. Otherwise, there will be a bat with just one wing. And so, uh, and it becomes easier for you to interpret uh, different artifacts when you have two intercoastal, sp uh, intercoastal uh, spaces visible. So that three ribs is your uh, ideal width. Gain. So um, how to adjust the gain? So if you are lucky enough to have an eye scan button on your scanner, just hit the eye scan. It just it does a job for you. Otherwise, um, I'll not go to the nitty gritty of how the gain, um, you know, uh, uh, is, uh, what do you call, uh, gain settings are done, but, uh, just to understand it is to make the image uniformly bright. That's, that's the whole idea. So you can, you can, you can use your gain setting, the gain knob on your scanner to uniformly brighten up the image. That's the whole idea. Um, the most important thing with the new scanners always switch off the harmonics. We don't need the harmonics because harmonics, it kills the artifacts. That's, that's the whole point of harmonics. So whenever you are doing your other scans, like um, echoes and all, you don't want to see all the lines and, you know, artifacts because you're looking at the organ in the lung scan. We are looking at the artifacts. So we don't want to clear the artifacts. So switch off the harmonics and some tips to get the good images. Position, very, very important, both of the babies and the operator, whoever, whosoever is doing this scan. So you have to be very comfortable and, uh, you know, so that you don't have a catch or something. Um, the babies has to be very comfortable because if it's a fighting baby or resisting baby, you know, feisty baby, you're not going to get a good image. Uh, you won't be able to focus on the particular uh, uh, section or the, or, or the plural line. So, um, Position is very, very important. Then ultrasound gel, pre-warmed, of course, um, uh, for the holistic scan of the babies. Uh, we don't want to make them cool. Um, so pre-warmed gel. And very important thing is, um, uh, again, ultrasound waves hits air. So you want to take that air pocket between your scanner and the baby. So we have to use the ultrasound gel. Second most important thing with this uh, gel, gel application is you don't put a lot of pressure on the on your probe because if you put a lot of pressure, you can imagine it's going to squeeze out your gel. So if you're squeezing out your gel, it's no good. You're going to have some pockets of air again. So keep a very light hand uh, while doing a lung scan. And believe me, it will give you, it will give you brilliant images if you, if, if you keep a light hand. And then, of course, always ask for help, uh, be it your colleagues or nurses to position the baby. As again, uh, Alok has uh, uh, mentioned multiple times, you know, it's, it's very, very important to keep the baby contained so that the baby is not fighting with you or the scanner um, so that you get a good images. And ambient lighting of the room. This is, an, again, one thing I have noticed um, uh, while we are doing scans or, you know, we are having these sessions with our trainees here in uh, UK. You know, the 
well lit rooms you know uh, window shades open or bright lights on it's going to affect your skin how because um you're not going to have a proper gain function uh, because to you the images will not appear as bright if you have a too bright of a surrounding and you will uh, you will sort of try to overcompensate that with the lot of gain and it will make your images very fuzzy so have a very uh, ambient lighting in the room uh, when you are doing the scan you know uh, just shutting the window blinds or dimming the lights while you are doing the scan it gives you beautiful images you'll try to um, uh, you will get the best of the adjustment on the gain and focuses right moving on to the lung profiles so a profile air profile uh, a prime profile um you know there are a lot of um uh, what do you call this uh, protocols uh, in around the globe and this is from the blue protocol um they like to call it as a prime but it's just an extension of the a a profile a for air and then you have b profile anything that fills up the pockets of air with fluid blood whatever anything that is liquid will give you b profile and combination of a and b if you can see both it's a b profile and then there is a c profile um we'll talk about the c profile when we come to the images but this is consolidation so if you have a consolidation c profile very straightforward a b and c profile so a lines um for the a profile of course so a lines they represent air as we have discussed already they are horizontal always they are very sharp and they are discrete they are repetitive and equidistant uh, we have gone through that and um uh, it's a reverberation artifact and it's originates from the pleural line and you can see a lines both in the normal lung of course lungs are supposed to be filled with air or you can see that in the pneumothorax as well pneumothorax air again so you see a lines in a normal lung and the pneumothorax when do we lose a lines when air is replaced by fluids um what kind of a pathology a well, all sort of pathology rds alveolar edema transient tachypnea of newborn and uh, uh, you can uh, you can see um uh, what do you call this uh, bronchopulmonary dysplasias so anything that replaces air will give you b lines so that's when you lose a lines air is replaced by the blood and exudates in a diseases like infection pneumonia hemorrhage again you 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 lose your a lines you have a collapse of the segmental collapse or you know small pockets of collapse in the lung um or you have a consolidations again you lose your a lines you get c lines or shred sign we're going to talk about those things when we um uh, when we get to those uh, slides but this is what you see in pneumonia and atelectasis so you can see there's a wide variety of pathology where you lose a lines again artifact so um um air a lines loose air loose a lines b lines right nothing to do with the b <laughs> it's a curly b it's been named b lines because it's a, 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 it's a, a same thing as a curly b lines on the chest x ray and it depicts the same thing in the chest x ray curly b lines you know there is a fluid in the fissure b lines on the ultrasound you know there is a fluid in the alveoli or interstitial space so they are well defined they are hyperechoic they are vertical lines arising again from the pleural line anything you see on lung ultrasound all arises from the pleural line sideways uh, and vertical reverberation artifacts and it erases the a lines of course because if there is fluid there won't be air and it moves with respiration unlike the comet tail artifacts it extends all the way to the bottom of the screen that's the way you differentiate it from the um, uh, comet tail artifacts and um, because comet tail artifacts it uh, 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 they terminates midway so it doesn't reach the uh, uh, end of the screen but consider comet tail artifacts as the precursor of the b lines if baby is getting worsening you will start seeing comet b uh, i mean comet tails which will progress to b lines and if the baby is improving you will see you know the there were a lot of b lines or qualis b lines and start is getting better now we are seeing more of a comet tails and and then it disappears um yeah so curly b lines of the ultrasound is it normal to have b lines then 
Yes, if it is less than three B lines in one segment, and by one segment I mean batwing sign. So if you see two ribs, intercostal space, and um, uh, uh, in that particular intercostal space or a segment, if you see less than three B lines, that's acceptable. That's normal. It is abnormal if you have more than three to I mean three to five is a gray area. More than five B lines is definitely um, a, a abnormal and beyond a point it qualies and it gives us compact b lines we're going to talk about that and compact b lines or qualies b lines consider it as a white out lung in chest x-ray when you see a white out lung in chest x-ray something is fluid with air or there's an inflammation again exudates and loss of air you see b line uh, you see a white out chest x-ray and exactly the same thing you see compact b lines on the lung ultrasound here I have listed out the difference between the comet tail uh, and the B lines. Um, I'm not going to read that out. We have already discussed this, but um, this is the difference between the um, lung rockets and the B lines. Moving on to the M mode. So we have uh, done the uh, scan uh, in the 2D and we have seen the artifacts. And now we, we want to interrogate the particular area of interest in the lung with the M mode. Why do we do M mode? Just to make sure that we are dealing with the right pleural sliding, positive pleural sliding, or are we dealing with a pneumothorax? And there are other pathologies as well. So M mode is a motion mode. Um, so it's, it's sort of a one dimensional ultrasound view of the lung. Well, not the lung, of the pleura. So, <clears throat> If you have an air, you know, the lung filled up with air and the, um, well, no lung, I mean, pneumothorax, uh, you know, all filled with air, you're going to get a barcode or a stratosphere sign. And if you have an air and fluid interface, which is normal uh, in, uh, in the lung or in a pathologies like um, RDS and TTNB, you will see seashore or a sandy bit sign. It could be in the normal lung or in the uh, 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 pathologies. Uh, where the lung is filled with the fluid or in the interstitial uh, uh, areas. And if you see only fluid interface, if you see only fluid, I can imagine conditions like, you know, um, embyema, uh, pleural effusions. In those kind of a scenarios, you're going to see something called a sinusoidal sign. So basically, these are the three signs uh, which, which we are trying to look at when we are interrogating with the M mode. So, uh, example, um, I'm sure it's um, clear to everybody. So this is um, um, the seashore or a sandy beach sign. You can see uh, there's an air and fluid interface. How? Uh, it's all B lines. So definitely there is fluid. Um, I cannot make it out here, but there has to be some air as well. Um, <clears throat> And, uh, uh, and the plural lines. So we'll, we'll decipher this one um, uh, in the upcoming slide about the barcode sign. So <clears throat> again, step-by-step -step approach of the lung ultrasound. I'm repeating myself a couple of times now. Is there a plural line? Is there is a plural sliding, which is end crawling effect? Um, <clears throat> and do we see A lines? Do we see B lines? Is there comet tail artifacts? So these are the questions you answer, and then you, knowing uh, with the uh, combined with the clinical background, you come to a conclusion. Um, I'll just run through this one because I've repeated myself a couple of times now, um, and I can see Alok has already um, shared the um, uh, reading material where from where it has been picked up. So uh, I'll not go through this. Um, but this is just an approach to, oh, I'm sorry. This is just an approach to come to a conclusion about pneumothorax. Um, right. We have seen pleural line, now pleural sliding. So end crawling effect. <clears throat> you can see three ribs, two intercostal spaces, nice and discrete, very crisp B line. Um, you can see your focus right. Um, you can see A lines coming up. And then um, there is some comet tail artifacts. So if you see cometal artifacts or the B lines, you know for sure there is a pleural sliding. Even if you don't see it, you, you, can, you can appreciate very well that you know, there is a pleural sliding ongoing there. 
if you see what I mean. I mean, <clears throat> that's the end crawling effect. It's, it's, it feels like the ends are crawling there. Same thing here. So there's definitely a plural sliding and some commit till out effects. When do we lose plural sliding? Well, number of conditions, it could be pneumothorax, uh, plural effusion, collapse or consolidations, and chest tubes. So these are the conditions uh, to name a few uh, where you can lose your pleural sliding. Let's talk about pneumothorax though. Of course, there will be an absence of pleural sliding. You will see A profile, or as the blue protocol likes to say it as A prime profile. So it's all A lines because it's all air. There is no fluid. That's that's what pneumothorax is. So you're not going to see any B lines or cometal artifacts. So absence of B lines and cometal artifacts is a profile. When you interrogate that area with the M mode, you will see barcode or stratosphere sign. And, and it is a pathognomic sign uh, for the pneumothorax. And uh, you will see a lung point, uh, which is again a pathognomic sign. It's, a, it's, it's, it's basically a transitional zone between the normal aerated lung and the area of the pneumothorax. You might not see lung, uh, lung point if it is a you know quite a sizable one or a complete collapse of one side of the lung, then you might not see the lung point. But if you see, it means there is a transition between the normal lung and the pneumothorax area. So this is an example of absent pleural sliding. So you don't see any, any uh, B lines or cometal artifacts. Then what are we seeing here? Of course, that's the respiration movement and um, uh, but transmitted uh, to this particular segment of the lung, but you cannot see the pleural sliding. You cannot see any B lines. You cannot see any uh, cometal artifacts. So this is a transitional area where you can see some B lines are coming up. Sorry about that. Oh. Right. Um, sorry about that. Um, so that's a lung point now. Um, you can see this is an area devoid of pleural sliding. You cannot see any B lines or cometal artifacts. Whereas this is the area where you can see nice pleural sliding. You can see your B lines moving with the uh, pleura. Um, you know, um, there is a there is a B line coming up here as well. So this is a normal aerated lung, and this is a this is a, this is the area where there is a pneumothorax. So normal lung, and this is the area with the air leak, and that's your lung point, the transition between the normal lung and the air leak. And we interrogate um, uh, with the M mode. So this is first the normal, the normal lung, seashore or a sandy beach sign. Again. It's a stretch of imagination as we, I think in radiology, we'd all love to do that. Um, so that's your sky. That's your sea. And this is your sandy beach. And um, this is what it looks like. <laughs> um, so if you can imagine, so that's, that's, that's the sandy beach sign. Where is barcode? It's straightforward. Uh, you interrogate the area with the pneumothorax, you see a barcode sign. If you see what it looks like, I'll show you the comparison as well to be very clear. So that's your barcode sign. And uh, so this is side by side view. So this is a normal sandy beach appearance and this is a barcode appearance. You can see this grainy area, which is not present here. The, sand, the, the, the sandy beach is not present here. You do not see sky uh, and uh, sea over here. It's all lines. It's all stratos, uh, you know, stratosphere or the barcode-like lines. And this was the same image, uh, which I, uh, uh, the video which I showed you uh, just a while ago. So lung point, where you see a normal aerated lung and the pneumothorax. So when you interrogate these areas, you know, in quick succession, this is a kind of image you generate. So when I was interrogating this area, I got the image of a sandy beach. As soon as I moved my cursor over here on the pneumothorax area, you can see the generation of this stratosphere sign. So this is how it looks like. Sandy beach, stratosphere sign. 
collapse consolidation and uh, atelectasis. So any loss of aeration, loss of A-lines, alveolar or interstitial edema, it will give you uh, emergence or abundance of B-lines, which all will be true in the collapse or consolidation. You have a collapse loss of aeration. You have consolidation, some degree of loss of aeration, and there will be, if it is a pneumonic consolidation, it will be filled up with um, uh, uh, fluids. Uh, if it is an atelectasis, loss of aeration. So, uh, and you will get air fluid bronchograms, which will be static and dynamic. And I'll show you what I mean by that. There will be disrupted or irregular plural, plural line. Um, this is not exactly the stretch sign, but we'll come to it um, uh, when we see the um, uh, images. And there will be a loss of plural sliding. So if you have collapse or consolidation or atelectasis, you will have all these features there. Depending on if it is a pneumonic or infective process, you will see kind of air bronchograms or fluid bronchograms uh, depending on the pathology. But there will be presence of all of this. And there is something called as lung pulse. Is it is it is not um, uh, plural sliding. It is just a transmitted cardiac pulse. Um, and the the good way to differentiate this from the plural sliding is it will always be equal to the heart rate of the baby. So uh, you can see the lung pulse, and I can see the heart rate on the monitor, and you can come to a conclusion that you know this is uh, this transmitted uh, pulsation is from the heart of the baby. Bronchograms and shred shine. So you see dynamic air bronchograms in consolidation. Um, it is nothing but um, small pockets of air uh, trapped inside the consolidated area. So whenever you're, the baby is trying to breathe in and out, there is some degree of movement in that consolidated area. And that gives you the dynamic air bronchogram. Static bronchogram is you know when you have a collapse or at lactatic area, which is not... Uh, taking part in the respiration at all. So whatever air has been trapped inside that um, uh, atelectatic or the collapsed area, it doesn't move with your respiration. And it, it still appears like white dots because air will appear as white dots. And it gives you um, a static air bronchogram. And then there is a shred sign. Shred sign is not exactly um, uh, the broken plural line. It's not a broken plural line, but it is a border of consolidation. So the border of consolidation appears quite shredded and broken. And it is also known as a fractal sign. And we'll, we'll, we'll see uh, in the upcoming slide uh, what it looks like. Right. <clears throat> you can see a small area of uh, uh, consolidation here. Um, uh, at lectasis. So, um, and you can see you know, when you have this uh, atelectasis or collapsed area here, you can see your lines are broken. It's an irregular, irregular, irregular line. So this this irregularity or this this broken border of this atelectasis or consolidated area is called as a stretch sign. And talking about this static bronchograms, you can see this small dots and packs of air trapped inside which is not, not moving with the respiration, it's all static. So th those are the static air bronchograms. Um, similar kind of a picture here. The way to differentiate atelectasis, uh, you know, from the consolidation, one of, one of the thing is like in an atelectasis with the baby's breathing movement, it tries to open up. So when it tries to open up, you see more of a B lines. Um, and as soon as it collapses again, you see you see this shred sign coming into picture. Here is also an area of small atelectasis. So it tries to open up. So whenever it opens up, you see nice um, smoothen out B lines, uh, which is not nice by the way for the baby. But uh, you can see you can see it's, it smoothens out. But as soon as baby expires, it collapses back. So that is more of a uh, nature of an atelectasis rather than a pneumonic process where you will see. Uh, dynamic air bronchograms. You don't see dynamic air bronchograms in atelectasis. Right. Um, again, the static bronchograms, if you see the small pecs uh, of air. Right. Again, this broken area here you can see is your stretch sign. It is not exactly pleura. 
um, um, but the border of the consolidated area. And um, this is one of the condition here when you have yeah, you know this uh, um, uh, pleural effusion. That is the time when you see actually the lung. Otherwise, you never see the lung. You always see the pleural line. So, <clears throat> what we are seeing here is your, you know, fluid-filled air bronchograms. These black areas surrounded by the white packs. If you see, these are the fluid uh, bronchograms. Um, they are dynamic in nature, and they sort of tells you that you know there is some kind of a, um, a infective process uh, going on there, and it's 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 sort of pleural effusion there, uh, which is pushing onto the lung and you know making giving it this particular appearance, and um, uh, of course there's a consolidated area here all throughout, so you can see a shredded sign or a fractal sign, and that's your dynamic air bronchograms as I mentioned, they are moving. It moves because there's you know fluid field. Um, <clears throat> again, a nice area. Uh, well, not nice. Uh, an area of consolidation here, where you can see an echoic or hypoechoic center. Again, very suspective of uh, um, infective process, pneumonic process, um, and you can see quite a broken. Uh, um, uh, I would not say pleural line, but quite a consolidated area with a broken uh, irregular margin. So that's that's your shred sign. And this n equic area is your consolidated area. Again, because we are talking about consolidations, all consolidations are not mnemonic. Um, the, that is very important to know and uh, to understand. And hence, I've put in a slide for the subpulmonic consolidations. So subpulmonic consolidations are sort of a hallmark sign for the neonatal RDS. I think Alok's going to cover that in the next uh, session. Um, uh, but the purpose of keep putting this slide over here is just to uh, let you know that all consolidations are not infective. Subpulmonic consolidations are more uh, indicative of a RDS uh, uh, pathology rather than infective or collapse uh, or um, uh, atelectatic area. So you see subpulmonic just at the level of the pleural line and uh, uh, you don't see uh, dynamic air bronchograms uh, with the subpulmonic consolidations. So they're very, very micro, micro areas of uh, consolidations because of the lack of uh, surfactant. So that's subpulmonic consolidation. And you can see quite a white out lung here, but I'm not gonna spend much time on this because Alok's gonna um, cover this. Um, again, just to show you the example of subpulmonic uh, uh, consolidations. Right, pleural effusion again uh, is indicative of um, not always, but most of the time of a mnemonic process. And sometimes you can have pleural effusion because of hemorrhage or um, you know um, more aligned uh, long lines uh, with PN in the pleural space. So how do we how do we get to know and what are the signs? So it's an equic area separating parietal and the visceral pleura is the pleural effusion. There will be an absence of pleural sliding, of course, because that's your parietal pleura. Normal sliding is your visceral pleura slides against it. You have a fluid in between them. You lose your um, a, a sliding. So you don't see a sliding anymore here now. There is something called a squat sign, uh, which I will show you. Um, um, it is about uh, when, you, when you scan that particular um, area with the pleural effusion, you see a quartz sign, and then you see curtain sign and the jellyfish sign as well. It's too many signs to know uh, in a one day session. So <clears throat> we'll keep on repeating this as uh, we move forward with the um, uh, uh, with our sessions in future sessions. Um, and then when you interrogate that area with the uh, M mode, you see a sinusoidal sign. I'll explain all of those. So coming to quartz sign, Right, so that's your um, uh, rib. This is a rib. This is parietal and the visceral pleura, the um, uh, sharp line there. This is your anechoic fluid. Is anechoic is always black because it ultrasound waves passes very easily to the fluid. And then, if you draw two lines, so quartz sign is four borders. So 
parietal pleura, visceral pleura, and through the ribs, if you draw two parallel lines, so that's your quad sign. So this is what you see on your pleural eff uh, effusion. So that's your four borders, uh, parietal, visceral, uh, um, uh, pleuras, and uh, two parallel lines from the um, uh, rib. Sinusoidal sign. So same place, if you can see the same area, and now I have interrogated that with the M mode. When you do M mode, you don't see stratosphere sign or barcode sign or anything like that because it's all fluid field. It's, 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 it is not air or it's not air fluid interface. It is only fluid. So these are your ribs, uh, as you can see on your M mode. And this is your sinusoidal sign. All this black area here is your fluid. So ribs, ribs. So it comes as ribs, ribs, ribs. Anechoic area, black in M mode, and then you have your um, pleura or the lung coming in the picture. Now, why do you get a sinusoidal sign? Because with each respiration, your lungs moves in and out, or you can say up and down. So as lungs keeps on coming near, you know, to and fro from the transducer, so it, it, it generates an image like a wave because it's moving like that. So... It's going towards the transducer, away from the transducer, towards the transducer, away from the transducer. So you get a nice sinusoidal sign. Jellyfish sign. Um, again, don't ask me why only jellyfish. I don't know. But the movement of your lung, you know, the kind of movement you see here, flapping of the tip of the lung in the pleural effusion is a jellyfish sign. You can name any fish, but... Yeah, it's a it's it's a jellyfish sign. Um, so movement of the tip of the lung in the uh, pleural effusion. So that's jellyfish. And when you zoom in this particular area and you scan here, then you will see this tip coming in the view and going away from the view. If you see that, that's called curtain sign. So like a curtain, it comes and close that gap when it breathes when the baby breathes in. And with the expiration, it goes away like the curtain, uh, the curtain, and then uh, it opens up this space. So curtain sign. Right. So pneumonia. It's a clinic. There always has to be a clinical background with prom, maternal sepsis, choriamnitis, you name it. It's always a non-homogeneous disease involving the segment or the lobe of the lung. It is very rare that you will see both the lungs, both right and left involved, you know, the pan involvement of the lung. It's very rare. It can happen, um, but so far I haven't encountered. Um, it's, it's more sort of a non-homogeneous affecting one particular area of the lung. Pleural line always become coarse and thickened. You can imagine because it's an inflammatory process. It inflames the pleura as well. Hence the look of, you know, coarse and thickened pleura over the only the involved area of the lung. The rest of the lung, you will see nice and discrete pleural line, but on the, over the involved area, you will see a coarse and thickened pleural line. Lung sliding may be absent in the particular area of consolidation. There will definitely be air bronchograms. There might be a fluid bronchogram. You will see a stretch sign, which is um, a, a, a stretch sign and the consolidated area, which is called a C profile. And if you have a pleural effusion, you're going to see the quartz sign and the sinusoidal sign as well coarse and thickened pleural line is this is what i was talking about so it's 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 more sort of a so this is a discrete line here it's very because this is a non-involved area and when you come down here where is the mnemonic process is ongoing you can see it is broken and it is quite thick right I think we are coming to the end of it. Now, pattern recognition, same thing. We have just clubbed it and said, this is A profile, this is B profile, this is C profile. So A profile, you only see A lines. This is a pneumothorax area. You don't see any pleural sliding here. There is no movement whatsoever. So A profile, and if you read a blue protocol, A prime profile. Um, again, same thing. So here, this is a profile um, uh, with, uh, you can see a nice pleural sliding. There's a lot of pleural sliding going on. There you can see 
uh, you know, B lines also coming up, reaching all the way to the bottom of the screen. So again, A profile or bamboo spine appearance of the, you know, uh, A lines. Right, same thing. A prime, as I said, if you have a pneumothorax, Blue Protocol likes to call it as A prime. You'll not be wrong to call it as A profile as well. It's just that A profile without the pleural sliding is A prime by definition. A profile, all the A lines without the pleural sliding is A prime. You don't see comet tail RFX, you don't see B lines. A B profile, voila. <laughs> if you see the combination of both, you see A lines and you see B lines as well. Call it as A B line, uh, A B profile. Where do we see it? A lot of conditions, you know maybe getting worse or maybe getting better you can see transition from b to a and in between you will see a b profile or maybe getting worse transitioning from a to b and in between you will get this a b profile b profile all compact b lines or coalesce b lines think it as a white out chest x-ray so more is the severity you're going to lose out on the rib shadowing as well now, that's not because your ultrasound wave is penetrating through the ribs. It's because of your, this movement of the ultrasonic waves is so much because of the fluid present there. It's, it's vibrating all throughout. And because ultrasound machines don't have a, a brain to think about, it, it's, it generates an image you know, uh, throughout and it, you, you lose out on your, um, uh, what do you call this, uh, shadowing, acoustic shadowing. So more is the severity of the RDS or the SAID pathology, you will see completely white out. You, have, you will see in some of the pictures that it has completely white out. So that's B profile. As you can see here, you can't see any spaces in between. That's your B profile. Um, because we have spoken about lung point, which is a transition between a normal aerated and pneumothorax lung point double lung point is because is a place where uh, is a transition between the area where there is well aerated lung and the other area which is more of a fluid filled lung or you can say a combination of you know you see a, a sort of profile in this part of the screen and you see complete b profile on this part of the screen that's a double lung point for you so a profile b profile and this transition area is your double lung point. We're going to talk, I think Alu is going to talk about it anyway in his uh, session with you guys with uh, on RDS and TTNB. Um, you will have a lot of repetition about this, but to understand this is what it is, um, uh, the double lung point. Again, um, similar example, um, uh, aerated lung, not so well aerated lung. So, a profile, B profile, and this transition area is called your, um, a, what do you call, a double lung point. And as I mentioned, more is the severity you start losing out on your rib shadowing as well. You can see, you're not seeing, ideally you should be seeing this rib shadowing all the way to the bottom, but you can't see that. It's because of your, the more is the severe, you know, fluid field area or the pathology, you will see compact and loss of, um, compact B lines and the loss of the acoustic shadowing. Same thing, A profile, B profile, and double lung point. Um, same uh, about the C profile. Oops. Okay, I don't know why I lost this slide there. Right, I think, um, uh, I don't know, I, I, I might have forgotten to put a slide here. But uh, C profile, as I said, any consolidated area, when you see a consolidated area uh, with a lot of B lines, then it's called C profile, C for consolidations. Not, <clears throat> it, it, it could be any kind of consolidation. It could be atelectasis, it could be pneumonic process, um, a, a, a collapse. Um, anything that gives you consolidated shred sign is C profile. And about the pattern recognition, um, uh, let's not uh, kill ourselves with a lot of information today, but um, uh, because we're going to go through this again uh, in the upcoming sessions, so I'll not talk about this. 
Um, but just to understand uh, what we are seeing, I think you guys know now already, this is A profile, um, A, B profile, some B lines coming up. Um, again, this is B profile, compact B lines. And this particular area where you can see some consolidations is your C profile. This is this is what it is. And these are the patterns. Uh, and it could be any disease with the correct clinical context or background, we can come to a conclusion why we are seeing what we are seeing and uh, what pathology we are dealing with. Right, um, that's the end of my session and uh, um, uh, love to answer your questions. Alok, did I uh, complete it within the time frame or? Yeah, you've, you've done fantastically well, I would say. So we've got uh, about 11 minutes for questions. Uh, sure. What I would say is guys, uh, uh, who would like to go first? Can I ask something? Yes, please, Anna, go ahead. Hi. Uh, sometimes I, I see in the screen that the uh, A lines are in the bottom and the B lines in the upper field. It's an inverse double lung point. Sorry, I didn't catch the question. You're saying you see A lines in the bottom and B lines on the top of upper the screen? field? Yes. Okay. No, uh, at the top. Uh, at the left, okay, um, in the longitudinal. You mean cranially, craniocordial yes. is what you meant? Cranial, is cranial I have B lines, mm -hmm. and caudal, I have uh, A lines. Okay. It's not uh, usual. Um, it, it depends on the position of the baby and kind of a pathology you're dealing with. Um, um, uh, what it basically means is, you know, the, the place where you are seeing the B lines is, you know, uh, not well aerated. It's, it's, it's some kind of a fluid is there. And the area where you're seeing A lines is well aerated. Ideally, or most usually the scenario is on the cranial side is usually well aerated and you see more of A lines there. And, uh, you know, the, by the virtue of gravity, uh, it, it's always perlocates to the basal areas and to the, you know, um, R3 or L3 kind of zone where you see most of a B lines. Um, but as I said, that's the ideal thing. Um, uh, ideally what we see, but it depends on the position of the baby. If you have, if you have moved the position of the baby, um, uh, you can see the other way around as well, but it's not very usual to, you know, see it like that. Sometimes, it might be a probe thing. I'm not sure, you know, um, uh, because sometimes we get engaged with doing the scan so much. We, we, we sometimes put the probe in the opposite direction and felt like, okay, you know, the cranial thing we are seeing at the caudal end. So I think uh, Abhijit has correctly alluded to the fact that it's a reflection of lung aeration. And I mean, what you're really looking at is areas of lung that are well aerated showing kind of a profile with a lines and a very classical example that you might see is when you actually give a baby surfactant and that mm -hmm. surfactant redistribution can actually vary and uh, you know uh, sometimes especially if you give surfactant to a baby uh, that goes down the right main bronchus you do the right lung and you actually see an a profile and you do the left lung and you see a b profile but clearly even within the lung you might have differential aeration uh, one of the other areas that I've sometimes seen patterns like that, you know, when you see meconium aspiration, you've got uh, areas that, you know, are aerated, but areas where you've got patchy meconium. So B kind of lines, B profile, interspersed with an A profile, interspersed with consolidation. So virtually everything, a mix of everything. Those are the kind of conditions where you could see this kind of pattern. Okay. Uh, just going to, so uh, Abhijit, the next person is Funny Priya. So yeah. Funny Priya, would you like to ask your question? Uh, we're, while we're waiting for Funny Priya, uh, Dr. Hasun, Dr. Hasun, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Uh, yes, good, good evening. Thank you very much for this amazing lecture. Uh, just I'm confused between two uh, terminology, if you if you can consider yeah. it, between double lung point and AB profile. 
So uh, when we can label it, this is double long point, we have a line, we have B line, and in the other way, when can we label it just a B profile? Thank you very much. Yeah, um, so I broken it down for the ease of understanding and it's best not to label that as an AB profile. Um, <clears throat> when we talk about AB profile, it is more of a homogeneous thing. You know, you see all the segments using A lines and, you know, some B lines. That's that is that pattern is called AB profile. Just for the ease of understanding or to explain things in a double lung point, we see A profile basically you see a lines well aerated lung and you see most of the b lines on the non so well aerated lung and that's a double lung point but to strictly call it as you know uh, a b profile it has to be more of a homogeneous sort of a thing you know in the same segment you are seeing a lines in the same segment you are seeing some you know superimposed b lines so that is a b profile not segregated you know one side is a profile and other side is b profile and we call it as a b profile no so that is lung point i was just trying to explain that this part looks like a, a profile this part looks like a b profile um is is what i meant so no you cannot label it as a b profile it has it has to be a double lung point only called as double lung point i hope that answers your question thank you very much very very clear dr sujit i can see your hand raised please go ahead with your question uh, hi, hi, uh, Abhijit. Thank you so much um, for the talk. I had a few questions, if you don't mind. So yeah, yeah. So, uh, forgive me if these are fairly basic. So one of the things that I sort of um, um, understood from my reading around the literature is when you scan, say, for example, you're scanning R1, are you placing the probe and then taking, uh, storing the picture? Or uh, is there a recommendation to slide towards your lateral uh, your anterior axillary line. Sorry, because so that, is that my colleagues have done, it looks like it's a static picture. Mm -hmm. and then you, you store that image and then you analyze that. Static as in, uh, I, I didn't... As in you're not moving, static. you're not sliding the, uh, the um, probe. Okay, so you are okay. Uh, if I've understood you correctly, do we keep the you know store the that loop while we are sliding or we yeah, is, is and just, we store? Yeah. Well, there is no, there is, I mean, not such anything that you can't do it. And eventually, like when you are looking at either all these zones of the lung, you're gonna eventually slide and see uh, things. So I don't, I don't see a reason why we can't store it like that. I always store it like that, and uh, uh, you know, while I'm doing the scan, uh, I slide, go back and forth, and see. Especially so when we are thinking of pneumothorax, you have to go through all the zones of the lungs anyway. So it's basically a choice if you want to focus some particular area and you are convinced and then you take a you know um, loop of that and store it or while you are doing it you are sliding ahead going ahead and you can um, and store that as well um, but i don't think so there is anything um, uh, standardized that you cannot do this or you can't do that so just to answer your question as well i support what abhijit is saying so there is basically the concept of what is called comprehensive lung scans Comprehensive lung scans allow you to slide the image so that you can actually get what is called. So if you, if you look at your, your camera phone, you get a panoramic view, which basically gives you a view of the entire room uh, in a kind of a 3D view. So I'll send you an article which basically looks at comprehensive scanning, which means that you can actually see all the lung fields in a kind of a, a, a three-dimensional image. So that is one approach and that's something that Jing Liu and his colleagues are doing in China, but actually what we would be doing, and this is really important. So you're, when you're doing your, your kind of uh, longitudinal scanning, you really want to do R1, but for a big baby, R1 obviously is quite a large area. Now it may be that you scan R1 in the merely, and actually you find everything normal. You scan R2 uh, and you have an area that's a point of interest. So I would say that if that's the case, and you're kind of somewhere in between, you can say that, well, this is R1, this is lateral to R1. So you can store both images, but what is important is that if you have a point of interest that's giving you pathology, that you save both images. So, but that kind of approach where you're gonna slide your scan, your probe to give you what is a comprehensive image is not possible with every machine. 
Yeah. No, the, the reason I ask that is, so say if you have, I know it in an extremely prem baby, the, the, the footprint may cover a fair bit of the chest, but if you have a bigger baby, the point at which you're scanning, obviously you'll see the pathology. Now you can argue that the pathology is not restricted to that little bit of footprint area, but say if it is um, a slightly smaller pathology and if you slide and if you're getting a different, say if you're scoring, if you're getting a different score, I take it, I take it you take the worst of the, of the scores, isn't it? So what I'd say is that for the BRAT score, the standard approach is to take one clip and look at your worst score. And what I'd say is that, you know, those points as defined by BRAT uh, basically are lateral to the sternal margin, one lateral view and one posterior view. I think overall, you know, when you look at the way it's been studied, I'd say it's fairly, com most of the babies, you know, it's not, you're not going to get a significant change by moving three millimeters here or there. That that yeah. would be my my take on it. The other thing that I would say that's very important, like if you're you're trying to scan and you're really worried about missing pathology, the pathology that you will miss is consolidation, deeper consolidations, posterior consolidations. So really, I think what I'd say is that comprehensive scanning means you are scanning longitudinally R1, R2, upper, lower, R3, R4, lateral, upper, lower. Uh, R5, R6, posterior, upper, lower, but then you have to do what I would say are your transfer scans in each intercostal space. And transfer scans can pick up pneumonia. In particular, the plap point, which is the posterior point, is a very common site because a lot of consolidation, pneumonic consolidation, if the baby's supine, will go and the exudate will basically go into the posterior lung fields. So what is really important is that what is the indication for which you're scanning? If I'm scanning for a pneumothorax, air will rise anteriorly if the baby is, you know, supine. So really, I would be able to get most of my pictures by doing the anterior lateral fields. And by moving my probe, I'll be able to identify the lung point. But actually, if you go posteriorly, because air is anteriorly, so if you get what I mean, what, what really governs how much to scan, how much to handle your baby is the indication for which you're doing the scan. And I think in particular, if you're worried about consolidation, pneumonia, you're looking for BPD and you're trying to define BPD in different areas. You're looking for a, a focal atelectasis. A comprehensive scan is not just your, uh, your longitudinal scanning. You have to then scan each individual intercostal space. No, no thank you so much. That's, that, that's, that's very clear. My second question was, um, you know, so the three uh, ribs and two intercostal spaces, what is sort of recommended as the, the bare minimum? Say if you have uh, I know some of the pictures you've seen more than more more than three ribs, but say if you reduce the sector width, will your resolution sort of improve because you're getting all of that sound into a much smaller area? Um, I don't think so. It's it's gonna you know make a ma major impact in terms of resolution because with the yes, of course, if you are using curvilinear or other probes, then it will make a difference, and that's where I was talking about the limitation of you know the curvilinears and how to use that. Um, but for the hockey stick or linear probes, I don't think so. It's gonna make much of a difference. Yep, absolutely agree. The one thing I'd say just if you have a big four kilo, five kilo baby, and you start using the hockey stick the footprint of the hockey stick is going to be very small, especially when you're starting to do your uh, uh, longitudinal scans. Now, if that is the case, uh, what you really have to do is you have to scan smaller regions. And uh, some authors will use uh, a kind of right anterior upper, right anterior mid, and right anterior lower. And that will technically cover three rib spaces. Now, you're really talking 12 ribs. So you might actually be doing three to four anterior images if you're using a hockey stick, which has a very small footprint to be able to get your entire longitudinal scan. And for that reason, I'm, I just, I love using the linear probe in big babies just because I'm, I'm much more able, you know, I, I'm quite happy to compromise a little bit on my frequency in that situation, but the anatomy is just a little bit more better defined by using the linear probe. So having both of them is a blessing in disguise. But the absence of it, and as uh, Abhijit will say and mention, and Nadia will tell you, you know, if you don't have it, you use what you have. But just make sure you're scanning all those regions if you have a smaller footprint. 
sorry, lastly, Abhijit, <laughs> sorry, sorry to ask you a lot of questions. Um, the, the differentiating between consolidation and atelectasis collapse, do you think the plural line will help? Because the, the dynamic uh, um, and static air bronchograms, I have to say, they're quite tricky to sort of to tease out. Uh, is there mm -hmm. a sort of way to tease out between the two? Um, I mean, basically, we have to zoom into that uh, sector wherever you are seeing the, uh, you know, this consolidation. Uh, I, I agree that in today's presentation, it is very difficult to, you know, sort of um, uh, get hold of this uh, dynamic and static air bronchograms or fluid bronchograms for that matter. Um, <clears throat> So you really need to zoom into that particular area to be able to tell if there is a dynamic or the um, air bronchograms. I'm sorry about my dog; he's getting impatient. Um, uh, about the plural line, yes. So if it is an atelectasis, you know, um, uh, the way I differentiate atelectasis from the you know other uh, consolidation is um, in the you know the mnemonic or infective process the um your plural line becomes quite uh, you know uh, inflamed and it appears more thick and cross and uh, you know broken whereas you don't see all those features in the atelectasis like you know baby who is being uh, ventilated you know uh, or the baby who has some collapse and when you when you see that you know you have instituted cpap on those babies that atelectasis starts as, uh, you know opening up or gone up on the pressure it started opening up and on those babies, what we have seen or you know, usually seen is that, you know, the plural line is not inflamed or broken or, you know, uh, um, or uh, thickened. You don't see uh, those features on atelectatic uh, uh, collapse of the lung, whereas you do see all those in the uh, uh, consolidated area, uh, plus your, you know, the bronchograms and, and you can have a fluid bronchogram as well in consolidated areas. Another thing I have not spoken about um uh, because it will be too much for a um uh, in single session we also do doppler of the area in the consolidated area so when you do that um in an infective process uh, you always um uh, see uh, quite a uh, increase in the um, uh, perfusion so if you are seeing vessels in that particular you ideally you should not be seeing vessels so if you see vessels or you see uh, perfused area then you know that that's an infective process whereas you don't see that in the atelectasis it, there is absolutely no flow or vessels you can see there so that's the way to uh, differentiate the two but you know just for a sake of a single session i haven't included all those things but as we move forward we will be talking about those areas as well no, thank you so much thank you Alok, I, I can't hear you if you're talking. Um, I was going to say, uh, I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank Abhijit for giving us an absolutely amazing talk. So uh, I I would say that, you know, we, we keep learning from each other. We're learning from you, but uh, I've learned so much from the talk today. Uh, absolutely lovely graphics, Abhijit. Thank you so much. Uh, just to say that uh, I will be editing this session. Uh, so it might take me about 48 hours to get this on because this is quite a long session and I might split it into two, splitting the peer uh, review and splitting this session. Uh, thank you, Alok. Thank you, everyone, for your uh, patient listening. And uh, I know it was a bit uh, <laughs> too much in uh, a single day. Um, but yeah, we, there will be a lot of repetitions, I think, and uh, uh, um, we will iron it out uh, by the end of the session uh, about differentiating all the uh, pathologies. Lovely. Lovely. Thank, Thank you, everyone. everyone. Thank you.